Hey, good day, everybody. Welcome to the Indian Boxer Ring. Um, today is actually a special uh, day in, you know, in the books of Indian Boxer Ring. Uh, it started as a breed education forum back in April of uh, 2020. Um, we actually had our first web interview in uh, 2020, in the month of June. Our first interview was with uh, Diego Garcia. And we've come a full circle in the last one year. Uh, we've actually had the I've had the opportunity to have on my guest chair many luminaries in the boxer world uh, who have been extremely gracious with their time and in sharing their journey with boxes. Um, we've actually discussed a lot of details about the breed, about uh, you know what you know what are the different questions that we always had to ask. Uh, you know, those questions have been answered by our judges. Uh, of course, Indian Boxing Ring does not promote, uh, well, the, does promote the breed. It does not actually, uh, it, it does not actually endorse any views of those guests. So, of course, this is perspectives that judges bring to the table. And as bo boxer fanciers and lovers, it is for us, for us to take those perspectives and move further or move forward. Uh, my chair, on my chair, guest chair today, rather, uh, is one of the boxer luminaries, uh, as I called uh, it, the royalty uh, of uh, boxer boxers. I have Anne Ingram with me as well on my guest chair. Um, now, before we actually get on to the interview, I just want to make a brief introduction for those viewers that are tuning in that might not know Anne Ingram, and I suspect that's going to be just a few people. Uh, Anne Ingram's uh, um, is actually has had has had the breed or has. Uh, been with the breed for many years. In fact, her mother, uh, Millicent Ingram, uh, founded the breed in Ireland in the year 1939. Uh, now, both Anne's mother, Millicent, and uh, Anne have judged boxes at Crafts. And um, Anne Ingram is an FCI all breeds judge and has judged uh, in, I would say, approximately in about 50, 50 countries across the world. Uh, she was also to be, and was also supposed to be, or was scheduled to be the best in show judge at Crafts in 2021, had, and unfortunately that got cancelled. Uh, we hope to look forward to see Anne in one of the shows coming up. Um, Anne is also a mentor uh, for the breed in the UK. And uh, for the session today, um, what we have in store for you is we have uh, we have, a, we have actually a presentation that Anne has put together. It's about the evolution of the modern boxer or modern English boxer. And following that, uh, I will all have the opportunity to ask Anne some questions uh, on her journey with the breed as well. So for those that are tuning in and are watching the interview, uh, this is gonna be really an educational interview because uh, you have Anne's interview this morning, uh, the presentation and the interview this morning, and, I, and you have Westminster, later in the day if you're going to be tuning in so it's it's an interesting day uh, and boxes i believe are going to be uh judged at around 3 p.m eastern time so you still have a lot of time ahead of you i know you some of you in england might be missing the football game but i'm sure you can watch it on the rerun but this is an interview you don't want to miss um if you have any questions for Anne, feel free to put them on under the comments and i will put them in front of Anne. Uh, before, without any further ado, and are you ready for the two-hour two-hour interview? How are you doing this morning? I am indeed. Thank you very much indeed for the for the glowing introduction. Let's hope I live up to it anyway. I do my best, uh, and thank you very much, Chris, for inviting me. As you say, we have a lot of competition for time today, and to add to that, it's the warmest day this year in Ireland. So I think a lot of people are going to be out sunning themselves rather than glued to their computer. But uh, hopefully they, they'll tune into it later on. Wonderful. Um, I, okay, so we'll go with the first slide. Um, as you sure. can see from the, the picture of me as a, a child, uh, I started. With... I, I'm not. I'm not put that slide up on the screen yet. So I'm going to actually uh, hand the controls over to you, and okay. I'm going to actually. And do you see that slide on your screen now? Yep. Perfect. All right. So you can take it away, Anne, and um, and we're looking forward to uh, 
getting your perspective here. Thank you. Go ahead, Anne. Okay, thank you. Um, on, on, on the leading sc screen, we have my mother on one side with the early Turkey and boxers, me and my last judging appointment in England. Well, when I say last, I mean most recent, hopefully not the last last. And me as a very young child with the boxer. So as you can see, I was very much reared with them. When I um, suggested to Chris I should do this presentation, um, I don't know that I quite let my, knew what I was letting myself in for, because the more I delved into it, the more fascinated I got by it. And there was just so much information out there. And as I've said on the screen, I want to give a huge thanks to Robert Madood and Linda Carnaby. The wonderful record they uh, the record keeping is just beyond anything and any queries they have they were able to come back straight to me with them the answers they really are a great asset to the breed so just out of interest i put up the um, photograph of the early import into england and um, one thing is um, the obvious is that lovely hammy backside on her but i'm, I'm not too sure about the head on her but i i suspect if she's got you in her sights and um, didn't like you too much she would be able to hold on with the vengeance so no story about boxers i think would be complete without mentioning frost Upman. i came across this quotation from pat withers which i was surprised because i'd never actually heard her regarded as a scruffy old woman and I sincerely hope it wasn't true because nowadays we totally regard her as a legend. I think to, I wonder do we really appreciate what a hard life she did have and how difficult it must have been to keep the kennel of boxers. In a way, the boxer evolution was a game of two halves. You had the very wealthy people in, in America and Britain who were able to buy in these great dogs and then you had philip and frost stockman who really had quite a harsh life D didn't really have a lot of money and basically had to sell the dogs to be able to feed them so i sometimes wonder do we actually appreciate the dedication that they truly had to the breed and her book, if anybody hasn't read it, please try and get a copy of it. It's, it's just, it'll bring tears to your eyes. It'll make you smile. The um, sculptures that she made, the, the drawings that she does, I mean, you know, what a talent. And I, I think it's lovely to see her with the, the group of boxers. Doesn't that say a lot for their temperament? They look so chill there. And of course, temperament was a big thing during the war because to be able to get uh, food for them, they had to prove that their temperament was sufficient to actually work. So it, it was a very important part. Now, I'm sure you've all seen many photographs of these dogs, but really when you look at them, aren't they really very, very special? Now, what did amaze me was when I came across the photograph of Zorn, he, he doesn't exactly have the front and the shoulders that, that um, his offspring did in Lustig, but he certainly set the type. And I think one thing I would mention too is that it was mainly the males that were sold. So Frost Rockman must have had an extremely strong bitch line to be able to keep producing such wonderful dogs in the quantity that she did. It couldn't have been easy. I mean, she really must have been a genius of a breeder. And as Karen Radusky said, at the time, Europe was looking for rather heavy head, probably going more for the bulldog type. And the Vendoms absolutely transformed the breed. And the, by doing so in Germany, they also transformed the breed all around the world. And I suspect there's not a decent boxer almost in the world that doesn't go back to some of her lines. I just put this up for interest. Um, I just came across the photograph to let people see what the German boxers were like in the 1941s. And I read a comment from an American writer who said that he thought there were several dogs in, in America that could easily beat these ones. But they're 
compared to some of the British dogs, I don't think they were too bad, but I don't know that I'd be particularly wanting to buy them. So then we go on to another legend, Alan Dawson, Stan Burned Off prefix. He was extremely unusual in that he wanted to promote the breed, he wanted to steer it in the right direction. And that was really his big thing about the breed. In one way, he wasn't overly interested in winning. Of course, it's nice if he did. But his main objective was to produce a, a good type of boxer. Um, I'm, I've written a few quotes, but I'm not going to. I'm sure you can read them yourself without me reading them all out. And I am aware of time for the presentation. I don't want to go on too long. But he was absolutely the leading light in boxers. And again, to this day, there's probably not many big winning dogs that don't have Stan Brand of breeding somewhere behind them. 1936 was when he started. He had bought a, a pet bitch in for, and he decided that she, much as he loved her, she definitely wasn't the type that um, was going to do well in the show ring or really the clear vision of what the breed should be. So having done a bit of research on the continent, he became friends with the Stockmans and he imported quite a few dogs. In fact, I think the total number was 14. But what an impact those early dogs would have. In particular, the Lustig Sunsiftig and also Frolic. Neither were in the country terribly long time because of the war. They were both sent out to America, which was actually America's gain and England's loss. But they did leave back behind um, a legacy that carried right through to the present day. He really adored Frolic and felt he was the best dog th that you could possibly have had. Felt himself very fortunate because apparently as a, as a puppy, he was quite long coated and resembled a baby wolf rather than the boxer, which I think was the main reason he got him. But he hosted a party, as you can see from the center photograph. So um, the boxer breeders could meet the magnificent Frolic. But sadly, it didn't go quite as well as he thought, because as he termed it, they started, uh, well, not when I say they, not everybody, but there was a smear campaign uh, a bit against the dog. And a lot of the English breeders didn't appreciate him in the same way that Alan did, which he really got quite upset about. Um, apparently, one of the issues with him is some people said he had light eyes. Um, I can't comment whether that was true or not. So here we move on to what his impression of an ideal boxer is. Um, I, I mean, looking at her now, I just think it's a good, honest bitch and should make a good breed bitch. I don't know that I would have quite seen her as the blueprint for the standard, but equally well, she has a lot of things to recommend her. Actually, one of the things I'm interested in that carries, carries through to quite a lot of that early breeding if you notice, there is quite a slope off the croup down to the tail. And I think nowadays we haven't quite got terrier tails, but the tails have come up a bit, which probably maybe shouldn't be quite correct. But again, this bitch has a lovely crest, neck and well laid shoulders. But I don't think she'd be wearing a CC anytime soon. So now we go on to the two frolic sons. At the time, uh, Elsie Ridley, Bontrepeau Boxers, was in partnership with him and she handled them. But she got very upset when he sold Dandelion off to, I think it was to South Africa. Um, I think he did it without consulting her about it and she was very fond of the dog. So that, that ended that partnership. But as you can see from the, the banner there, of 24 sets of 24 cc's on offer, 15 were won by descent and substantive. And then Zulu also became a very, very significant influence on, on the breed for many years to come. So he certainly made an enormous impact on the world of boxers in Britain. As Alan's health declined, Peggy Penn seemed to 
more or less appear out of nowhere. Um, but having bought a dog off him, somehow they clicked and obviously the personality suited. And he made her promise that she would carry on in the same vein as he had started off and adhere to the German standard. So he actually gave her the prefix of Stenberndorf. Now she wasn't actually the best of handlers, so he used, first of all, Alan Haslam, uh, Peggy Thompson's future husband, and then Philip Greenway to handle. I must say, I've always admired the salamander, which I thought she was really beautiful. So I, I think she maybe didn't let Alan down. So we move on to my mother. She saw a boxer when she was in Switzerland, when she was 17, came back, determined to have one, went to the early Crufts, really couldn't see a boxer that resembled what she'd seen in Switzerland. But then she saw an advert in Horse and Hound for a litter of boxers that Alan Dawson had. And that started a lifelong friendship with Alan. And in a way gave her tremendous access to the boxer world in England, as he included her in a lot of the parties, the meetings, places that she wouldn't otherwise have got to. As you can see in the newspaper cutting, I think if you saw him today, you would be inclined to say, is he crossed with the Great Dane? But I think the, the photograph there of, of Autocrat and Friedel demonstrate the complete variation in type that there was in England at the time. Nonetheless, he had a fantastic temperament and she absolutely adored him. But as a 21st birthday present, Alan gave her Stenbarn de Bombard. She campaigned to his Irish title. She also had Stenbarn of Jaguar to keep during the war as things weren't just quite as hard in Ireland as they were in the UK. And then returned him when things got better. But Bombard was to be the start of a very long line of Turkey and boxers. She also had a bitch called Folly that actually worked during the war. And you can see here that she has a certificate to prove it. Um, sometimes you actually wonder what the dogs did do during the war, but to, to actually have had one that, that did do that work is actually quite amazing, I think. She had a very serious fall from a horse um, and had a year in bed. Needless to say, the boxers were usually under the bed or certainly by her side. And I remember her telling me that the doctor got a huge fright one day when he came to visit her. And Pilot, as she called autocrat, was lying under the bed and suddenly appeared and growled at him. So I think the doctor hightailed it out of the room at great speed. But this allowed her, and it carried on for many, many years, to amass the most amazing collection of boxer archives. And I have to say, to my shame, I keep meaning to completely sort it out as into different categories. But the problem is when you start to look at it, you become fascinated with it and you spend so much time looking at it that you end up, you don't do actually any sorting out of it. But it is a wonderful record of the breed through the late 30s into the 40s and early 50s. And it includes a lot of um, of the dog's um, digress from America. So there's actually quite a lot of American features in it. In 1989, she got the 50 Years in Boxers Lifetime Achievement Award at the Boscars. She had her last judging appointment at Crufts with an entry, I think it was just under 260. And it was an anxious time coming up to it. Several of the committee members rang and said, was she fit enough to do that sort of entry? But she absolutely sailed through it. And despite being asked many times after to judge again, she, I think, very sensibly declined. So I think her swan song was a, a fantastic event. And she will always be remembered for that. And I suspect, I think she's probably remembered as being one of the best boxer judges of all time. As you can see down below her, my father, her husband, Oxy, he was also a breeder of terriers. And uh, it wasn't unknown, as you see in this photograph, for her to win best in show and him reserve or vice versa. 
And over the years, we brought in a lot of dogs from the UK because it wasn't always easy to travel with bitches. So we had dogs from probably most of the top kennels. Though initially the breeding obviously was still burned off breeding, then a lot of um, some panfield, then a lot of wardrobes. And then gradually, as things progressed, uh, Tigarth, Braxburn. So we had quite a, a mix of different bloodlines. Um, I think one of the good things about showing in England is it gave you the opportunity to see the dogs that were in the ring at the time and what dogs were producing, what bloodlines were producing. Um, so it gave you a great overview of the breed. To this day, Turkeyan is still lit, even though we haven't shown for a few years now, quite a few years. Um, it is the top boxer kennel in Ireland. And we have also made up six UK champions. In actual fact, Turkey and Avant, which was our first English champion, it was quite a fun story because we had two CCs on her. And, you know, bearing in mind, we had to get in a boat and cross the water all the time to go to the shows. It was expensive and also quite a lot of time off work. So we thought we would ask Philip Greenway to handle her. And he agreed, and we were over at a, a breed show. And um, I said, "Well, I get her off, and did you have a look at her?" No, no, I'll do it. No problem at all. I'm no problem. So he came back to me about ten minutes later, a little whiter in the face. Apparently, she turned into a cringing, nasty little heap when he went to take her off the bench. So he uh, said somewhat thoughtfully that it might take a bit longer to bring her around. So the next job was Manchester, and Peggy Haslam was judging, who was a legend in the breed. And I will never forget that day. Not only did we get to see, we, first of all, I should say we decided that we loved the bitch and we weren't going to send her over to Philip, but I told him. And then, lo and me down, didn't we win the CC? And we beat Sweet Talking Guy for best of breed. It was really a red letter day because Sweet Talking Guy was just the most wonderful dog and one I put up myself, so I had a really high guard for him. So, to carry on with Alan's story, um, at his own expense, he prepared this 25-page booklet of photographs of the breed, and he actually compiled the two to offer to the British Boxer Club, but they declined it um, and well they said first of all because it was based on photographs um, and they preferred to go for the slightly more American standard. I put this together because I wasn't sure how many people would ever have seen this but I, I have put several pages together um, and I'm certainly not going to comment on everything but I mean he was absolutely adamant that the breed standard to follow was the German boxer, and that was Stockman boxers. This was his introduction to it. And again, really, he, he is promoting the breed as opposed to himself. Um, I won't go into this because if anybody wants to write, read it, they can. But the things I did highlight was that, um, again, he's saying, First of all, that there were a lot of imports, which of course brought a huge variety in type, but that there is only one standard in Germany for the boxer, and that is Frau and Philip Stockmann's Der Deutsche Boxer. That was adopted by the Northern Boxer Club and the Midden Boxer Club, but the British decided to go down the American route. One point he did there say about the German standard is, is the proportions of the muzzle where he also goes on to say the muzzle of the boxer should be about one to two of the skull, whereas the American standard gives no direction in that character, with the result that muzzles in some American red dogs are far too long. So he's again saying the German standard. So each, each of these was actually a page, but I think it depicts basically 
You can see the dog swimming, you can see them jumping, you can see them in the family context, you can see them as softies, as athletic, athletic dogs. I actually find quite interesting, um, I blew it up so you'd see it a little bit better, the black and white boxers that were around at that stage, and of course, Czech boxers, which I find is, are actually quite attractive. But I, 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 I don't really consider them white boxers because they're, they're party colors, really. And I know the white boxer situation at the moment is quite controversial. So I, I won't go down that road. But I think it gives a great overview of the dog, what it looked like, how its character was supposed to be. And of course, there's another photograph of Lustig. He's very hard to get away from. So, you know, in one way, Alan was maybe ahead of his time because nowadays, I know myself and, and I'm sure there's a lot of other judges if we're judging breeds um, that we want to find out more information for. We do look for illustrated standards and extended standards. So. And also uh, with the FCI, they always go from the country of origin. So in some ways, the FCI and Alan were on the same page with regard to this. So the official British Boxer Standard was drawn up. And again, you can see Alan is not happy. He really wanted to stick with the German standard. But the British Boxer Club Committee voted them down. My mother actually was at that meeting, and bear in mind that these meetings were held in, in people's homes. And um, you know, a lot of these people were very wealthy people, as was Alan Dawson, so it was kind of um, really mansions they were held in. But she did tell me that there was enormous heated arguments over the standard both whether to include white markings in it, whether to allow white boxers to be shown. Um, there, there really was tremendous controversy over it, and it actually did end up making a split. Again, I put this on because I wasn't too sure how you know, if everybody had ever seen the original standard. Um, I find it interesting that Again, you know, there's a full page of, on the head, but I found it interesting that in those early days, the standard actually said the nose should be large and black with wide open nostrils, which of course is a very relevant thing today, particularly with the, all the controversy over brachiophilic breeds. I must admit that those two um, photographs dis displaying what nice ears look like, it's a shame they weren't on a better head. So I'll just go on through that. The other thing I did find quite interesting was in the color. If you see, it says white markings and fawn brindle dogs not to be rejected. That is a complete turnaround for what we have today. You, you could almost write in there that fawn and brindle dogs that have no white markings should not be rejected. So it just shows you how much times have changed. The adoption of, of the British standard again caused a great split and just couldn't accept that they had decided to go with the American standard as opposed to the German standard. So he created the Northern Boxer Club to serve the north of the country. And as I've said here in reality, he created his own club and surrounded himself with like minded people who shared his ideas. He was totally opposed to the alteration of the German standard by one word. There was absolutely no compromise there. And then as he said, what do they want? Round skulls, long muzzles, dewlap, and what have you. And there was obviously a certain amount of backbiting and jealousy. So I think you could say it hasn't changed too much. But the North-South divide was actually very significant because it actually created quite a difference in type, which I'll go into later on. Um, the north of the country were slightly more 
European in their outlook, whereas the Southern went more towards the American lines. So then we lead on to 1945 when the first open show was held. And my, was that some excitement? Again, my, my mother was there. Um, and, you know, as she said, can you imagine that th through the war, it, 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 these people weren't able to travel outside their own area. They had their own little fiefdoms where they were the kings of the dogs then, um, but they never actually met each other. So you can imagine both the euphoria and the disappointment of some of these people. You, you know, the backyard champion sometimes didn't turn out to be a champion. But it was a very significant show because Tom Scott was very definite in his decisions. Funnily enough, he's something I actually never heard my mother talk about very much on what she wrote about him, but I actually don't know very much about him, except I, I saw a quotation from Felix Price, the Phyllis Unboxers, where she said he always had a, a mild whiff of whiskey about him and a string of bad language, so I'm not sure if that defined the man or not, but he seems to have certainly been a good um, leader for the breed, for sure. And I put on the two um, uh, critiques there just to let you know. But it seems, um, and sometimes we, we, we see sagas played out on Facebook nowadays, that, that, that there was a saga played out in the dog papers as to, as to whether the judge had done a good job and whether the bitch was, um, she seems to be in the more controversial of the two. But it certainly got everybody talking. So then the following year, the, the big red letter day, the first championship show after the war. And remember, there were only five championship shows before the war. So there was little opportunity for dogs to get made up previous to this. So this was really a, another absolute landmark show in the history of the breed. Again, I've, I've put in the critiques for him. And I think what is interesting too is that these judges were very happy to discuss their opinions and stand over them. And I think it'd be probably fair to say that the breeders listened. Also, if you note with the Monarchist dog, he actually had very little white on him. And if you notice too, the Panfield Serenade, which she was actually handled by Marion Fairbrother on the day. So she has a huge history. So again, it's interesting as to what the judge said. My, my mother always said that the British boxer was more defined by the American influence post-war than the European influence. As you can see, she said that the breed was exceedingly fortunate to have such great judges to start off with and give a definite direction for the breed to go. Because again, I'd remind you that with all the imports that were here, there and everywhere in breed type. But what seemed to have been a recurring theme is wide fronts, heavy shoulders, wide skulls, short muzzles. We'd like more balance and elegance. But the other thing that John Wagner talked to the breeders afterwards, and as you can see, he said that he really felt that they lost sight of the fact that a boxer is a working dog and should be able to jump and run and, and um, be pretty athletic. But he also showed them photographs of some of the American dogs that are around at the time, which also, <laughs> I think uh, particularly Nan Hullock and, and uh, Debbie Summerfield, they were quite taken with um, the flashiness of the American boxers as well as the type. And you will gradually see between Panfield and Winking Light more and more white coming on the dogs until you actually get to the wardrobes where, where they were practically a paint. They looked almost as if they'd been manufactured. They were so beautifully marked as flashy dogs. But it's the Northern Boxer Club. <laughs> You can see in 1950, 
So four years on, the judges are really actually saying very much the same as John Wagner had said. Frost Ottman came, said the dog, show dogs were not good, mainly because there was too much difference in type. Dr. Harris said too many of the large skull type and that they need to breed more cleanly built elegant dogs. So it was actually a recurring theme throughout the breed. Inkspot, of course, made quite a sensation for himself because Dr. Harris gave him the reserve CC from puppy beating some significant top winning dogs at the time. And of course he did go on to be a very worthy winner. Just for comparison, I, I just put in a, those that came across these few photographs of some of the American dogs and I actually put them in for comparison. There's no doubt about it, they had a lot more leg and much cleaner heads than, than the British dogs that were around at that time. So when the 1950s came, as you can see from the numbers, there was a huge surge in popularity. Absolutely huge. Money could be made out of boxers because they were so popular and people are wanting to buy them. But as always happens when a breed gets terribly popular, it doesn't always do them much good because you get people breeding them that really have no interest. And as you can see what I've written there, um, a lot of them were shelly and lacking in bone, bad temperaments. And what I hadn't realised before that there was a trend, a trend towards a miniature boxer. But uh, thankfully, well, I, I use the word thankfully serious breeders valued the breed too much to allow it. But I feel that there's probably a lot of older boxer breeders who turned to having a Boston Terry or, or a Frenchie might have been quite glad to have seen um, a miniature version of the boxer. And I've often wondered that nobody um, tried to breed one. But again, you can see Alan Dawson saying that the, the, the vast importation of dogs from everywhere was more of a threat than a blessing. The German type, Dutch type, the American type, all of course erroneous. And again, he is saying, there is and ever has been only one type of boxer and that given its genesis by Germany. So he certainly never swayed from his belief that the German boxer was the right boxer, that the breed standard was the right boxer. I think as well at this time, you know, people like Alan were very good at keeping the breed on the right track, as, as with Panfield boxers and, and a few of the others. But also, which had a huge influence was they really had some very good judges and bearing in mind that there were very few specialist judges. These were nearly all all round judges, but they seemed to care about the breed and they seemed to know what mattered. So that helped an awful lot in the direction. If you look at the statistics for champions, I just put a few kennel names up here and I do apologize for not putting everybody up. There were so many kennels starting up then, it's hard to, to include everybody. But I certainly don't mean any disrespect to anybody that I haven't included. But I mean, that's quite a jump, 113 champions by 1960, bearing in mind that uh, in the 50s, there, there was only maybe 12 sets of CCs on offer for most of those years. If you think nowadays, I think it's something like 43 sets of tickets. And just to let you have an idea of what the early dogs looked like. He, Horse of Leith Hill, he was actually bred out of the, one of the very early litters and the only champion made up before the war. Unfortunately, it wasn't unusual for bitches to die welcome in that stage too. So some of the bitches, that, well, when I say some of, certainly a, if not two bitches that had won a CC before the war, both died welcoming. And one day I think Horsa is, he's got a bit about him, hasn't he? He's got a bit of a reach of neck, but um, I'm not sure I'd want to own him at the moment, but, but times change. But at least he, he has a bit about him and he looks as if he's a bit of nobility. 
the Vanderbilt, she might have been good for a day, but I, I don't think we'd be in her CCs nowadays. And of course, Panfield Serenade, who won a, the first championship show, she was also the first post-war champion bitch. So that leads me on to the Panfield Kennel, who was later Dibby Summerfield, married to Stafford Summerfield. And she really, well, she, first of all, she started very early in the, in the breed I mean, in the late 1930s. So she was part of um, making the new standard. She was very influential. Um, and she had a bit of a presence about her, I think would probably be the best thing. I actually, I loved um, Felix Price's description of one of her first shows where she said she saw um, a lot of prune face boxers and an attractive blonde swept past which turned out to be Peggy Haslam and a stately looking lady who turned out to be Debbie Summerfield. And I think stately lady is probably not a bad description of her. But what was interesting is the the bitch I should say think you could say that really made the kennel was this Alma bitch. It was a Lustig daughter, and in a way she got her, well not quite by accident, but she actually belonged to a family as a pet. And when the bombing started in London, she was advertised for sale. Dibby liked her, thought it was one of the best she'd seen, but the price was quite high. So I think she walked away initially, but then the people rang her and said, look, if she would take her, uh, that we, she could get her at a reduced price. So she, um, along with Mary Davis, and I, I think Marion Fairbrother, I might, I think that's right, um, bought her. And my heavens, was she a good bit to buy. She produced really the, the start of the champions and the wonderful producers. She, she was the dam of, Panfield Serenade, who was the first British champion, bitch, and Panfield Tango. But interesting enough, Tango and Serenade were mated to each other to produce ringleader. And I see right through all the top kennels that this very close breeding, which we couldn't at all do now, was actually very common. Ringleader, of course, himself proved to be such a wonderful stud dog you know, sarring seven champions. And um, Tango, who was the father of ringleader, also proved to be a very significant sire of his time. I wonder, when you read so much about the big kennels breeding very closely, I wonder is that how they managed to keep the type? I know we were quite in favour of um, grandfather-granddaughter matings um, and I never thought boxers were a great breed for outcrosses. Of course, you had to do outcrosses sometimes, but they, they quite often didn't breed terribly well too tight. So I find it quite interesting that they did all these close matings. Different times now, of course, you wouldn't be allowed to. Another thing the breed has to be thankful for for Dibby was that she developed a very strong friendship with Wagner and after the war thanks to that good friendship she was able to bring back some of the Lustig and Von Dom breeding back to Britain and um, Texas Ranger was another significant stud dog and he was the full brother to Bangaway so really a, a royally bred dog and a sire of six champions and a lot of other winners and in the other picture, you can see five of the Hanfield champions, five of quite a few more, I have to say. But she also, as well as being a, a significant breed, she really did have a terrific influence on the breed and was a very, very well respected. In actual fact, she was a mentor to Major Bostock. So we now have another very wealthy gentleman entering the, the boxer breed. Um, originally ran a circus and traveled all through Europe with it. So he was quite a showman and really the complete opposite to Alan Boston. 
he wanted to win. And if he couldn't read it, he bought it. Um, it really didn't have an awful lot of patience. He did actually start off with, with um, for a very short time, Marion Fairbrother as his kennel manageress, but the personalities just didn't get on too well. So um, Marion left after a very short time. And then he had Mary Groom, who was a fairly quiet girl who would have been expected to stay there. And then suddenly she went off and um, married Albert Langley very unexpectedly. But I'll go on to Peggy shortly. You can see again the first Bristol champion, very plain. Can't say awfully inspiring, but probably of her time. But again, Major Bostock imported an awful lot of dogs as well, uh, mostly from America, but he did have a few European dogs there. Um, and he brought in some of the cream of American dogs. And as you can see, Peggy said that um, he always wanted to win, never liked to be beaten never prepared to wait long enough to breed dogs and go off and go out and buy stock. I have to say he, he um, must have had quite a good eye because one of the ones he bought was Andil Sheldon, she Sheafton, sorry, that's a misprint there, um, Hooch Me. Douglas Sauer liked her and out came the checkbook. And she proved to be a very great asset to him. She won 10 cc. She was the top winning bitch, helped make him the top winning kennel. So she was well worth buying. But another one that he saw was Geronimo Carissima, another bitch I've always admired greatly from her photographs. He tried to buy her, but Peggy didn't sell her. So what does he do? He offers Peggy a job. At that time, she was um, Peggy Thompson. She might even have been Peggy Thompson at that stage, but anyway, she became Peggy Haslam. And that was actually, um, apart from getting the bitch, it was an inspired partnership because Peggy was very extrovert, also a very good handler, and also very knowledgeable about the breed. So with, with his money and um, her great abilities, it certainly launched off a very successful partnership. The Ken by Clarion Call was an interesting dog because Rita, who bred him, had rung Peggy and said, look, do you want to come and have a look at this dog puppy? He's very nice. Peggy never quite got around to it. But then when he appeared at his first show, she really, really liked him, tried to buy him, but Rita didn't want to sell him at that point. But then, unfortunately, her husband got a posting abroad, so he ended up at the Bristol Kennels. Though he ended up with his retirement back with Rita again. Again, we go back to this great hospitality that was right in those days. I mean, can you imagine nowadays somebody inviting everybody belonging to a boxer club to come and have your cocktails before lunch, then your lunch, then the competition for the dogs? And then afternoon tea, after all that, no charge of any kind for entry fees. And I wonder why it says here a good number of people accepted this generous offer. In fact, who would if it came to? By this stage, um, Major Bostock was president of the British Boxer Club. And again, Peggy got on with him very well. And she actually said he got a bit of a bad press because people didn't really understand him and gave him a bad name. But in actual fact, he helped more people than they actually realised in many ways, both with money and, and with breeding. Unfortunately, he did not see fit to make provision for his dogs or Peggy in his will. So one morning she rang up to the house, as was her usual practice, and the son answered the phone and he had died the day before and the family didn't want anything to do with the dog so they just told Piggy to get rid of them all. And a lot of breeders did step into the fray and, and, and buy dogs and rescue them. 
Um, but I think Peggy and Anne actually ended up living in a caravan for for a time because I remember it was the home gone as well as the, the dogs, but it, it was rather a, a sad end to what had been a great partnership and a great kennel of boxers. But as the saying goes, one ill wind blows another good one for somebody else. So Janice Mayer bought Bristol Miss Lacey and it became the first bitch that she ever won a CC with. And strangely enough, something I didn't know until they actually advertised it not very long ago, it was my mother that gave her her first CC. And if the, the um, dog in the picture is, of course, um, the wardrobe dog right in my autumn gold. But we'll go on to the wardrobe story later on. The um, amazing thing about Gunnold is, thanks to Suzanne and Lynn, the kennel lives on exceedingly successfully, um, right up to, well, before COVID. They were still winning CCs and making up champions. And I suspect we'll carry on doing so for quite a bit longer. So it's not a bad record to make up your first one in 64 and another and still be making them up in 2019. And of course they travel from Scotland all the time. So it was it's quite a long trip. So now we move on to another wealthy man. And it's unusual too that there would be so many wealthy ones around that wanted to spend money on boxers, but it didn't do the breed any harm, that's for sure. And Martin Summers had Marion Fairbrother as his kennel manager, manager, yes, I'm not sure if we need to be politically correct in these terms anymore. And one of the memories I have actually was going to visit there when, when I was quite a bit younger with my mother and she had judged um, Norman Legend, who of course was a very big winner at the stage, and she hadn't put him up. And she said to Marion, I think he's long. And Marion said, no, he isn't. And somewhere or another, she managed to procure a bit of string and proceeded to measure it from his height of shoulder to uh, from his front to the back to try and prove that he wasn't. But all I can say is neither lady was for giving up on their views, though. Um, they had to basically just face each other off. But it was rather in the... Um, it's funny how some things just stay in your mind over things like that. But I think one of the, the greatest influences that Summerdale had was the import of Sirocco. What a dog he was. And I actually had the privilege of seeing him in the flesh. The impact he had on the breed was absolutely sensational. It really was. I mean, 13 champions. And also remember, we're, we're still talking about times where, where there aren't an enormous number of CCs on offer. So it really was um, a, a game changer. And of course, he brought a bit of elegance with him as well. And he had a beautiful head. And as you can see from these pictures of the Summerdales, the white markings are starting to creep in. In some ways, Gremlin and Summerdale are, are a story of two halves because Marion was shown boxers before she went to work for Martin Summers. And thankfully, she was shown them afterwards. But when Martin Summers went rather dramatically bust and ended up with time in prison and um, Marion went off to Italy leaving some of the Dutch in various kennels around the UK but as often happens the far off fields weren't as green as she thought they were going to be and within a year she was back again and I think it's a great credit to her ability that she managed to pick up the pieces again and breed some wonderful boxers she was also a very good judge. I'm trying to think of it. I, I don't think it would be right to call her a difficult person. But she wasn't an easy person either. She was a very strong character. She was quite strong with her dogs, a very, very good hander. 
but again, really cared, cared about the breed um, and was very determined when showing the dogs to get the best out of them. And of course, in 77 came along, I think he was actually made up in 77, the hugely influential Grenland Summer Storm, who was down from Sirocco and again, quite closely bred. For a while, I think I'm correct in saying he actually did hold the breed record for brindled dogs. Um, and he certainly did an awful lot of winning and influenced the breed enormously. As you can see, he's got a good length of leg. He's got short back. He's got a nice light line. Uh, you know, the breed has progressed quite a lot at this point. And one thing I, I at that stage, I'd kind of start to travel a bit around the world, not, not enormously, obviously, because I was still quite young. But one thing I have to give Marion great credit for, the dogs she exported were all good quality dogs. And they in turn helped a lot of breeders around the world to improve their stock and be the foundation of kennels coming up. So she deserves a lot of credit. She also was a very gifted um, artist. And she and Peggy Thompson, later Peggy Haslam, wrote the book Boxer Blarney. Again, if you haven't read it, I definitely recommend you do. I, I particularly featured these, these drawings that she's done, because even though they're identical drawings, doesn't the cropped ears make an awful difference? I mean, if you think in the silhouette of the full dog, that cropped ears just makes that dog look as if he's a bit more neck. It gives him a bit more, more nobility. And the same with the, the, the head type, it cleans up the skull. Um, I sometimes wonder, do we actually pay enough attention to the difference that cropped ears make? Not that we see them very much, except when we go over to America or Canada nowadays, as it's banned in most of Europe. So another very, very influential kennel. My memories, and I, I don't actually remember seeing them in, in the flesh, but some of them I would have been too young anyway. But I always think, first of all, what the, the kicker bitch I thought was beautiful. I mean, look at her there. She, she really has nearly anything you'd want in a boxer. A lovely, well-laid shoulders, good fore chest. The head looks pretty decent there. But she actually proved to be such a good brood bitch and it was behind most of the Winking Light um, stud dogs. Um, the Winking Light kennels really had such tremendous influence through Justice. And as you can see from the drawing, Justice had seven champions, but six of them were for wardrobes, and that included Miss Meek. So, my goodness, did he do a great job for the wardrobes kennel. And also, uh, he's behind all the Weatherford stuff, a, a, lot, a, lot, a lot of the marbled. I mean, he was hugely in, in, influential. And of course, Dar uh, he, he was sired by Jad and Jupiter, who he was very tightly bred into to produce a lot of these dogs. But as you can see, the dogs got bigger, got longer in leg, probably got more substantial. I think we're starting to see dogs that are more of a stallion of a dog uh, with a bit of ring presence, maybe a bit more attitude. And in actual fact, we had Winking Light German, the Justice Son for a year in Ireland. And I'm telling you, he was a tough dog when we showed him. We, we used to have to put two chains on him. Nobody messed with him. He stood his ground for everything and everybody. So we move on to Felix Price. Well, what a character. I think I would be fair in saying there has been nobody like her either before or since. She had such a, a sense of humour, a turn of wit, um, sarcasm. She was such a classy lady. And yet life wasn't easy for her. Um, she was a teenage bride 
became a war widow, young child. And I remember my mum telling me that, um, you know, sometimes when in the class was make or break for Felix because she depended on the prize money. Yes, we used to get prize money in those days, believe it or not. But she depended on the prize money to pay for the petrol to go home. And of course, she was always, 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 always fashionably dressed. And again, my mum told me that she would appear quite often at the shows with suitcases full of clothes, obviously high fashion, and she would sell them off at the shows as well. So um, she certainly knew how to make ends meet. In a way, it, 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 it's quite a funny how she started in boxers with her first champion, because nowadays it wouldn't happen. The Clisby Sparklet dog, she bought him off the benches. I think she paid, I might be wrong in saying she paid £15 for him, but certainly it wasn't, it wasn't a huge amount. Well, it probably was in those days. Um, and he was her first champion. Um, and then she had a bitch but to Major Bostock's dog, as you see here. And I mean, I love her sense of humor. What, what, what on earth was I thinking of? You know, the idea of using little Caesar. But Pharaoh opened the back door and took things into his own hands. And it, it produced Felsine Fargo and Felsine Fabulous, who in their turn were terrific producers for her. Um, Pharaoh, of course, was a, a great producer. Uh, most of her stuff, I think it'd be fair to say as a breeder and as a judge, she loved style, she loved temperament, she loved showmanship. But with Pharaoh and Hot Diggity, with all the great producers, um, my mother always said their heads were not their finest feature. Um, but they certainly produced extremely well. And they had good construction, they were short, they had style, they had good temperaments. And in actual fact, one of the top bitches of the time, um, a bitch I always loved was Tama Shanter, which was starred by Hot Diggity. But he certainly was a fantastic producer, absolutely fantastic. Um, but I, I also read that at one stage, um, she had entered at Crufts in 1953 in five classes, would you believe? And she won them all and went on to win the CC, beating Geronimo Carissima. So it caused quite a, a stir, as you can imagine. But she always had a fondness, I think, for her meals. I think she really always rather prefer, preferred her meals. And they certainly did her well. She Probably could have made up another couple of champions, but by that stage she managed to sell her property to a developer and um, money was more available. And I think she um, lost her concentration, though never her love of boxers, and um, started to enjoy a bit of the high life rather than tricking to dog shows all the time. She certainly never lost her interest in the breed and carried on judging for quite a few years after. Of course, I think her, her biggest claim to fame was when she judged Crofts. You have no idea the excitement around the ring. No, particularly to see who she would put up but actually to see what she'd wear. And she actually didn't disappoint because she changed her clothes in the middle of the, the judging. And of course she put up Anne. Now we move on to Witherford. And this is where you can see very much the influence of the North-South divide. Pat liked them out showing on the loose lead. The dogs were kind of the type that eyeballed the opposition. And it started a kind of new style. Again, she was very friendly with the stockman, and that did her very well. Um, and she managed to produce all these champions, all going back to her first champion, who was closely bred to Jant and Jupiter, and going back to Lustig again. 
I'm just having a look at the client time here. I probably need to speed up a little bit. I think her um, greatest achievement was in Hot Chestnut, who went out to Germany. And as you can see from the code, Karen Ruzki said she really had a struggle to get anybody to use him to start off with. And it was only after he had sired several champions that um, he was widely used and then had such a wonderful influence on the breed on the continent. And he's been a dominant sire for many generations and really transformed the breed out there. Now, with the wardrobes, you see a, a completely different style, different type of person. Connie was quite a, a petite lady. The dogs were generally very well mannered, always very pretty, nicely marked, beautifully presented. And it was a, a different scene, really, with them. Um, you know, they had sheepskins on the bench long before the rivet beds. They'd have the wicker basket with the picnic in it and the champagne glasses. And they, they, were, they were kind of very special, would give class, I think, to, to the boxer world. And of course, Miss Mink was, was the absolute record breaker. I wonder how many CC she would have won now if she'd still been around. And of course, she retired very young. She also produced very well in that her, her son uh, proved to be a prolific sire. But again, we see an awful lot of inbreeding, very close breeding, but it worked very well for them and it had a huge influence on the breed. She was only beaten once and very unfortunate really the time she was beaten. It was actually by her sister at Crofts, Miss Sable, under Debbie Summerfield. And apparently the judge for the group and best and show had already put her up and had looked, really liked a bit. So it might have been a, a missed opportunity for her to go best and show, who knows. That all part of it is history. We'll just never know what difference it makes. These are all the wardrobe sires. And if you add up all those champions just on this one slide, that's 22, 25, 29, 38, 43 champions sired by these dogs. Isn't that amazing? So we swing back to Northern influence again with Mary Hamilton. Very much the, the, the same views as Pat Withers would have. Um, a bit more European in type, but one thing I don't think I ever saw her show one with a bad head. She stuck very, very true to what she considered the good boxer. And I think she must have probably, I haven't checked statistics, but she probably has done more winning the cross than any other kennel. And of course, De Desperate Dan was a phenomenal dog. Mary was a person of two, how do you put it, two sides. As a competitor, she certainly was very sharp. She was very good at giving the judge the evil eye if they didn't put her up and wasn't uh, behind the door telling them what she thought of them. But away from dog shows, she had a wonderful sense of humour and was an extremely good mimic. And she was so good to her dogs. And also, of course, her husband, John, was as devoted to both her and the dogs. I mean, it really was a wonderful, wonderful partnership. But isn't this amazing? The first champion produced all these champions for her and one for Shirley and Arthur Butters. I mean, what a producer. But again, you can see the style, you know, this nice front, this short back, good top line and a, a bit of attitude. So you can see how the boxer has progressed from being rather short legged and heavy in head to really getting to be quite an, um, an elegant dog, but still with plenty of body and substance. You know, I admired her so much. 1980, progressive axonopathy reared its ugly head. And there was only one dog left in the kennel that wasn't affected by the breeding. Bruce Katnack, who was the geneticist of the day, really dreaded telling them the news, but they were absolutely amazing. They took it on the chin. They rewrote their breeding program. They 
thanks to Bruce's suggestion, Hasty Harry was the one dog that allowed them to carry on their lines. And she imported these continental dogs and look what they produced. She carried on so successfully. An interesting story too, I think, about um, how she, she kind of managed to do that. I, I don't know whether the Marbleton Boxers, they, they produced exceedingly well for her and a couple of other breeders, but I'm not, I'm not sure that they uh, produced as well for the whole country, shall we say, as some of the other dogs. Uh, but certainly she produced a very, very good type of boxer. So then we meet, move on to Pat Heath of Seafield Boxers. Completely different personality, very affable person. Um, easy to get on with, very hospitable. Really concentrated on, on the good temperaments of the dogs. And again, it was a close, it was a brother-sister mating that started her off in dogs, or in the success in dogs. Um, and of course, Holbein was the first working champion as well. So she always had a strong em emphasis on temperament and their different abilities. And of course, this led to the great Picasso, the top seller of all time. And I would say, we can all criticise his head, but he had such ring presence. And look at the elegance there. Look at the height of leg. Look at those lovely quarters, not over exaggerated, no straight shoulders, no over angulated back end. Um, I was always a great admirer of his son, Art Master. And I think I might even give an able seaman ticket. But no doubt about it, Picasso had a huge influence on the breed and he was a great group dog and a lot of his children were great performers in the ring and there's just a snapshot of the children um you can all I always go back and have a look at this because i know i'm i've been rabbiting on a bit long here so we'll go on to the tiger boxers and Probably the first one, mild and bitter. He was unlucky not to get his third ticket, but I think you have to remember that it was a time of the big kennels and very difficult to beat the wardrobes, the Witherfords, the Marbletons, if you were a newcomer. So he really did very well, and he did have a significant influence on the breed. And the Tatler, of course, was real stud dog behind all the Tigarth breeding. Uh, probably not a dog that, that smacked you in the eye, but he was so well made and he had such a great influence. And of course this led on to another great sire, famous Grouse, who was, could be so relied on to produce the type of boxer, but he also was responsible for the loss of the red boxer because he was done and brindle. So as he was such a great stud dog, he was used. So you go from having Picasso, who obviously sired a lot of reds, to Bryce, who undid all those good red genes by <laughs> producing only brindles. And I think to this day, probably the brindles are still dominant in England. But as you can see from looking at these photographs, the type he produced was just such great boxers and so sound. The other thing about the Tiger Boxers is that Sheila actually sold quite a few big winners as well, like Blue Kiwi, who won, well, I'm not quite sure, but certainly in your 20 tickets, Glenn Morangi, who was the sire of Pop My Cork, which was a great winner for the walk on kennels. And then we move on to the Winnewick, who are still winning well today. Their first boxer came from Felix Price, but sadly she died whelping. So Felix actually offered them the sister. And that was their start of showing. And then you can actually see them winning the, their first CC under Marion Fairbrother. 
Um, their real success worked so well when they imported back in town and Red Baron, and they really never looked behind them since then. That combination just worked so well. And of course, it's helped an awful lot of the other kennels as well. And they are still winning, and I'm sure will win quite a bit in the future as well, in the capable hands of Tim Hutchins and Julie Brown. Another kennel that also bred and sold quite a few to other people to make up was Sue Harvey. And the grouse son pheasant plucker was a significant stud dog as well, as well as a big winner. And he gave the kennel their first all breed best in show win. I always think Sue was so unfortunate that she was never asked to judge Crofts. I think such a, a successful and significant breeder and dedicated breeder, uh, it, it's a tragedy that you never did get to judge it. And the Fairdorn breeding has kind of influenced the breed an awful lot. And it has helped an awful lot of people get started in the breed and make up champions. And then there's the Helen and Eddie Banks combination. Each were independently breed boxers before they met and got married. And what a successful kennel that has been. Brock Buster must be one of the greatest dogs of all time. Absolute wonderful dog. And his mother produced five champions. What a producer. But I think to be able to produce all these seven generations of champions is such an achievement because I don't think boxers always breed too. So I think any kennel that can do this definitely has achieved an enormous amount. And of course, they're still going strong too. And then the walk on kennels, but I know you're interviewing Yvonne in next month, so I'll not say too much about them. But again, hugely successful and um, have had great partnerships with. Jenny Townsend in the Genroy Kennels and, and also Mandy Lidlaw with the Romero Boxers. That's really worked so well for them again. And of course, um, they sent a lot of their own breeding out to Australia and came back. And I see I have a typing area there. It should be blue pink beer and Skittles. Um, not only was he a big winner, but he was also uh, a great producer as well and had a huge influence on the breed as well. So we're nearly finished. I just featured, as well as the top stud dogs, I've just kind of featured some of the other dogs that have um, actually sired quite a few champions. Um, I think the, the walk on Okadoki dog is, is an amazing dog because he sired the top, he was the top sire all breeds, not just boxer, but all breeds. I think it was 2018, but I'm sure I corrected if, if it wasn't. And again, his offspring are still going strong, breaking records. What I do find interesting is if you look at the top stud dogs, they're all significantly big winners in, in, in their own right, but the bitches aren't. None of these bitches significantly won anything other than maybe an occasional class. Um, and it was fairly unusual for the top champion bitches to produce but some of the uh, big kennels at the start, I think probably because they were so closely bred, did manage to actually get good producing lines out of their champion bitches, but not so usual. And then a full list of the top stud dogs and top brood bitches. And again, I think it, we should bear in mind that the, the championship shows weren't there certainly weren't anything like the number of CCs on offers or the possibility of making up so many champions. So um, th that was significant too. So the top boxer of all time, the top bitch, Brindle bitch, and top, well, top bitch actually. Top red male and top red female. I'm sure you're all fairly familiar with them. And I have to say, I've been lucky enough to have judged all of them, um, which is a wonderful opportunity that I've had. And there's the top kennels. Quite a record. 
So I'm sure the walk-ons will be adding those two CCs once the shows start going again. And I'm sure Winnowooks will be adding a few more champions to that. And that's the top kennels of all time. And again, I would kind of point out that wardrobes making up 31 champions before 1976 and Burstall's before 1965, that was some achievement because there just weren't the number of shows around. And the same with the, the Panfields. And just as a, a parting shot, I said, 2019 seems to be the, the year of, or 20, the year that records get broken. So Bangalore's record got beaten in America. And we have a draw at the moment in England. I think Argento must be one of the most unlucky dogs because he was on such a run and then COVID struck. So it will be interesting to see how his career takes off again once the shows take off. And that's it. All finished. And I apologize for taking rather a long time over it. Thank you so much, Aaron, for that. Uh, this was like, uh, this, this was such a well cataloged, uh, uh, you know, uh, journey of English boxes that you presented to our viewers. And I'm sure uh, it, it, it felt like it was, I was actually going through a book or reading a book. Uh, it's so well cataloged and well done. Thank you so much for having done this. I, Thank I, you so much. I apologize it took so long. I think I got a bit carried away with the early days. So sorry about that. <laughs> you can shorten uh, my interview now. <laughs> well, well I, I'm going to try my best. Uh, I uh, And again, I, I for the benefit of those viewers that are still with us, and I have quite a few of them, uh, please feel free to put your questions uh, on the screen so that I can also supplement my questions with yours. Um, and I wanted to actually ask you just a few questions. I know you covered a lot about the evolution of the breed uh, in England, but I want to actually ask about you, uh, you know, as, uh, you know, and more specifically about your journey as, uh, as a judge uh, in judging this wonderful breed of boxers. Uh, now, before I get into that, I just want to ask you a, a few questions about uh, about your mindset. You know, I know that your uh, you know your mother actually founded the breed in Ireland, and I know your father was uh, also a terrier breeder as well. Um, and but you took on the breed, the mantle of breeding boxes from your mother. Um, I just want to actually kind of I wanted to kind of understand your mindset. You know. You know, there have been, you know, too much of something is not good. You know, like, for example, it could be a put off or it could be a turn off. Uh, your household was filled with dogs. Um, you know, your dad was a professional handler, and I'm not sure if your mother was as well. Uh, no, but too. she was heavily involved in the affairs of the club. So yeah. you would have seen dogs, yeah. you would have seen dogs all along. Uh, but what decided, or what was your mindset, or what was that an organic progression that you took on the mantle of breeding boxes, or instead of taking on maybe another hobby or a vocation? Yeah, I, um, I, you know, I have a brother as well, and he went down the horse route, but I stayed with the dogs. Um, as a as a teenager, I got Boston Terriers just to have something different, and then um, we had a litter of boxers and and what appeared to be a dead pup. I managed to revive, so my mum gave her, she was called Turkey and Touch and Go, so my mum gave her to me as my own personal boxer, and um, I suppose you could say the rest is history. Um, I just carried on with them, but I do agree, it can, being surrounded with them could turn you either way, but I've just always loved dogs, and I mean, I worked with them, I reared them, I kind of looked after other people's dogs, I trimmed them, so mm -hmm. basically anything and everything to do with dogs. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, no. it's, it's it's hard to sometimes growing up be, be, because you know both parents were obviously very well known and uh, hugely respected. So kind of growing up in in the boxer world in, in your early years, you know, you were regularly being told that you weren't as good a handler as your mother, and you weren't as good a judge as your mother, and you weren't as good as anything as your mother. So, <laughs> but fortunately, it didn't leave me scarred for life. 
you know, you actually, uh, you know, uh, you took on judging, like for example, uh, a lot of breeders, uh, you know, a lot of breeders, actually breeders become judges and handlers evolve and they become into judges as well. What was your journey like? What prompted you to become a judge? And you, you're a highly respected and a decorated judge. But what got you onto the journey of becoming a judge? Was that also I mean, organic because your mother had done it? You did that as well? It was an invitation, really. That was it. I started as a judge when I was 16. So it just it, it was just, as you say, organic. It was just the next step. You didn't think about it. You see, it was an era when people were asked to judge because people thought they might be a good judge or they respected them as a breeder. There was no ladder to climb. Um, there was no, I have to judge that number of classes to do A, B and C. You were just asked and if you made a mess of it, they, they tore you to bits and maybe didn't ask you again or, or you, you learned to do a bit better the next time. Um, but I did start to judge very young. It wouldn't be possible nowadays. I, I gave CTs in England for the first time at 25 years old. So uh, right. I've been at it a long time, shall we say. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I remember uh, Andrew. Uh, Andrew actually quoted this uh, during his interview. Uh, you know, that was actually his quest. That was a question, one of the questions that I had asked him. You know, do you have any piece of advice um, for somebody who's actually taking on, you know, judging as, uh, you know, who's becoming a new judge? Uh, so any, any tip of or any tip for somebody who's becoming a new judge? And he said, uh, judge. You know, and this is something he he had heard from a, uh, another mentor, and that was that you know think that this is going to be your last show, right? And this is going to be a last show, and you know you want actually to make that memorable uh, and do it as you know enjoy it like that. But I want to actually ask you a question slightly different to you. Uh, now, one of the interviews that I saw of yours, I think it was with Calm. Uh, you mentioned that there are certain shows and venues that make you want to go back and judge them again. Uh, but I, so my question is this: What about a show makes you want to be invited back? I I, I think um, the the atmosphere of a show makes a huge difference. Also, shows get good quality entries. You know, countries that that you're going to get nice dogs to judge. But I think more than anything, the atmosphere of a show makes an awful difference. You know, of of course, we all like to be in a nice hotel and well looked after. But that isn't always actually the the kind of deal breaker. I think it's more to do with how the show is run. Um, and you know, are people enjoying themselves? Are the exhibits being looked after? Do the exhibitors value your opinion? Um, I, and actually, I've been laterally one of the countries I enjoyed the most judging in, um, and it was horrible to cold, wet, miserable two days was in Iceland. But the exhibitors were just so fantastic, and, and they, they laughed and they joked and they talked. And and, and even what one case, something was missing, I, I think it was um, English Springers, and an exhibitor was missing, and they knew she was there, so everything halted. And they went off and got her and got the dog. And I mean, it was quite a lot, of, you know, it was a good five, maybe 10 minutes. Then, of course, the woman came in, and she actually won with the dog. But everybody just was kind of delighted. And I, I think you don't get that sort of atmosphere so much at, at some of the big shows, but it, it just was really, really enjoyable, really was. And you felt the exhibitors were interested in your opinion and your reason for doing things, which isn't always right. the case. Right. Um, you know, I've got some interesting questions up from viewers uh, that I'm going to actually put on the front of your front of you. Um, so would you like an easy one or maybe I'll, I'll give you an easy one. You know, that, that's how the that's how the viewer has premised this question. He, uh, the, the viewer says it's uh, if you were to return through the ring post COVID as a handler, what boxer from the past would you like to be handling and why? Do the main one of my own or one of somebody else's? I'm not quite no. sure. A um, anything, I, any, any dog, yeah. Well, I, as one of my own, I'd actually love to have a Vaughn again. 
Um, I mean, she she was such a special bit. She used to sleep in my bed, and we went everywhere together. Um, that it was a real love affair with her, and I think um, if I'd had her, maybe even ten or fifteen years later, I would have actually been able to do an awful lot more for her and and with her. And she also was a wonderful show dog. But you know, at the time, the cost of going over to England and showing, you know, you still had to earn a living. Um, so you know, I think she she would have been what um, one of my own. I wouldn't have minded having her over again when when I had more, well, probably better off and better experience and so forth. Um, of somebody else's, I wouldn't mind have had having a go at Glory last. She'd have done me nicely. Now. I could have had a, had a turn with her for sure, but it would have been hard to do her better than Philip did her. She was always a bitch that looked fantastic and showed and. Really a great credit to her, her breeder owner. She really was. But um, I, I think so really sometimes you, you, you know when you you, you have and, and I would consider the the font bit you know a great probably one of the best we ever been. Um, you kind of feel later on that maybe you could do them better if you had them again, sort of thing. Though I don't think now physically I could do them better, but you never know. Um, sadly, the legs aren't what they used to be. Right, um, and uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, now, I read in one of the books, uh, box of books that I read, I don't know if it was, uh, I don't remember the author, unfortunately, but on this book, um, you know, you know the, the, the writer or the author says, you should judge uh, the breed and pick your winner, you know, or you should, that would be the one you would want to take home with you. Uh, now, I know you are, uh, you know, but that that's the template that person operated with. But I want to ask you this question. Now, having judged um, many breeds, and this is also a question from a viewer, uh, having judged many famous boxes over the years, which one would you like to take, would you have liked to take home with you? And that would be, you know, that would, and what boxes that you have not judged would you like to, like to have judged? I'll, I'll start with the second part of the question because that's a very easy one. I would love to have judged um, Diego's bit, Scarlet. I actually judged her sister, but didn't put her on, uh, even though she was a big time winner at the time. But I would love to have judged Scarlet. I, I think she just looked so magical. She really did. Um, of um, the famous ones, which one would I like to have? taken home um do you know I, I suppose a lot of them would would have would have been english ones um, i actually loved desperate dan i thought he was a fantastic dog um he showed under me funnily enough when, when he was a veteran i think it was a darlington show and she didn't bring him back in for the ticket apparently it was hot and he was tired or something but if she had i actually would have given him the ticket that day as a veteran he, he just he, he was a very very special dog so i wouldn't have minded having him in my backyard and i think also um when i judged in orlando i put up a south american dog draco's bonfire and i actually loved that dog too uh, he went on to brazil i think and became top top dog breeds there um, so again, I know my, my mother always wa wanted to have a cropped boxer, so she'd have been delighted to see him trotting there around the backyard. She could never quite tolerate the tails. I used to show her photographs of you know boxers where I'd been judging with tails, and she'd go, "Oh, take those nasty things away." She, <laughs> she wouldn't. Have, she wouldn't have done with the modern boxer at all. I'm afraid. <laughs> um, um, and you actually. You sorry, you um, you actually mentioned uh, something in your, you know, in the presentation. You actually mentioned about all those uh, big kennels and how they manage uh, to breed a particular type. You know, having had so many dogs uh, in their kennel. Uh, now I have a viewer question here, which related to that. Uh, do you believe that close line breeding is what is required to maintain breed type? Well, certainly that, that would have been the principle we followed. Um, uh, grandfather, granddaughter rating was a kind of favorite one of ours. And having bred other breeds as well, um, 
Uh, for instance, in, in poodles, if, if you had a good bitch and you mated it somewhat sensibly to a decent dog, you have a reasonable chance of getting good poodle puppies. But that doesn't necessarily follow with boxers. We always had a strong belief in, in the strength of the bitch line. Um, we would have actually always put great emphasis on, on the bitch line as opposed to the, the stud dog because you always feel you could go off and use somebody else's dog, but you needed a good steady line of bitches. Um, and undoubtedly, um, I, I don't know until I was kind of doing the research for that, that I realized that really most of those early kennels bred brother, sister, half brother, half sister, father to daughter. Um, and did that help them? You know, all those kennels I, I talked about, wardrobes you could go to, you knew roughly what type of dog you were going to get. You, you, you knew you'd get an elegant dog. You knew you'd get a decent head. Um, you kind of knew what you, if you had a bitch that needed an improvement in the head, you could use, um, you, you know, maybe autumn gold because you knew he'd give you a really nice head. Um, and like a grouse, uh, not that he was all that closely bred, but you knew you could go to grouse if you needed to improve your front and that you were actually going to. Um, there's a couple of types of stud dogs too. There's some that, that produce consistently um, and they're never going to damage your breeding line, if you know what I mean. And then there's other dogs that, that can throw some wonderful dogs, but in between whiles they're throwing some shockers. And I think that's where um, close breeding comes in. If they, are, if they are closely bred, I think they actually tend to be more consistent than what they produce. But of course, it's not possible to do it now. It, it's not allowed. You see, I think in a way it was natural selection, selection too, because the breeders were, were quite knowledgeable. So as well as throwing, out, throwing up good things, it also threw up bad things. But I think they were sensible enough if it threw up a problem, and then that was the end of that, and you just didn't do that again. Um, so it, it it was, I suppose you'd say, trial by fire. If it didn't work, then you didn't do it again, or you had too many problems, it, it didn't do it again. But I mean, certainly the weather, the weather for the wardrobes in particular bred very, very closely. Um, but most of those kennels that produce consistently all came from closely bred stock. Right, right. Thank you so much. Uh, now, you actually mentioned about styles of boxers in your presentation. You know, you actually mentioned that uh, there was a time uh, when the northern part of England bred, uh, or the breeders in the northern part of England bred based on European style, whereas the southern part of the England bred based on American styles. So my question to you, Anne, is going to be based on the styles being so different. I know that you you widely traveled. You know, you tr you've judged across the world, and this is a question I ask two judges, and it's no different. Uh, you know, I want to get your perspective as well. Uh, now, I know that you have a mental template um, of what a boxer should look like in its you know in its form or morphology of a boxer, but with the styles being so different, now does it make it challenging for you to judge this when you have top quality exhibits in each of the styles let's say for example you have let's say you are in this place let's say i'm going to take italy for example i know that's your favorite place to judge let's say you take you have it in italy and you have an american style exhibit which is really good and you have when i say good it's really top of the you know it's top notch and then you have a european style boxer what is your decider is it your mental blueprint is it going to be the you know the standard for that country uh what is it what is it is what is going to decide the read uh, the winner the ticket well first of all i i i, I take the view a little bit i suppose like alan dawson a good boxer is a good boxer no matter where it is in the world but of course there are there are different types but i mean you can see wonderful dogs in America, you can see wonderful dogs in Italy and, and Spain, probably not so much now, but, but I, I sometimes think the talking ban had a huge effect actually on the European boxer. Undoubtedly, um, there there are a lot of the European dogs that gone too short in, in, in face. But as a, as a judge, um, I think bearing in mind that the, the 
breed standard isn't that different actually between the British the FCI and the, and the American standard. They're, they're, they're nothing that significantly different. So really, you should be looking for the same dog. It just one that's more style and class than the other. I think you always go for for what you have as your own template and what you have as your own preferences. I mean, I I was brought up. You know, with my mum, if it wasn't a boxer, if it hadn't a good head, it wasn't a boxer. It was a mongrel run. Any mongrel running down the street can be well made and and signed. So that that's always been my priority. Um, is head, but of course it's not. Um, and I think even the more I judge other breeds and become, you know, an all rounder, I, I think you bend maybe a little bit like that. But I don't think I'd ever put up a bad head. Um, but I mean, I think with type, you 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 just kind of learn to deal with it. You know, I don't really think about it an awful lot. You you just have a type you like, and that's it, really. I suppose. Um, and I suppose also you don't really see. Um, you, you know, if you were judging English Springers, I'll give you an example. You are quite likely to get an American type of Springer and and an English type of Springer in the same ring in some places in Europe. And um, that can be a bit tricky, actually. But I suppose you, you're always going to go for the English type because of your FCI background. But I don't know that the FCI countries in boxers and a lot of them in an average entry are going to actually produce kind of superstars. And you see, I think one of the things is significant nowadays with boxers. How often do you ever see a, a boxer in Europe winning a group or a best in show? Virtually never. And I think the style, I'm sorry, I'm waffling on a bit here. I think the style of handling doesn't help them either because when they're in the breed, um, you know, if they're attracting them or double handling, which they're not allowed to do, but they do anyway, um, that falls apart when they go into the group because they can't really do it. So then it's like a bag of spuds when it goes into the group. So, you know, that doesn't do an awful lot for it either. Um, but no, I think it, really the short answer to the question is you, you basically put up what what your normal what you normally like, um, right? And I don't think you're that influenced one way or the other. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. Uh, and I want to actually get your um, I want to actually get your um, you know perspective about this. Um, now you are. You know, you are associated with a breed, or you have you wear different hats, like I mentioned, the head of a breeder, an exhibitor, uh, a judge. Uh, what I did mention is that you also are a part of uh, a club. You know, you charter the course of the breed in Ireland for boxers. Uh, now, when you're judging your favorite breed, which you're so passionate about, um, you know, the boxers, and Let's say the dogs that are presented in front of you, uh, according to you, are mediocre. What's your mindset? When you know, is your mindset to award them a ticket uh, because you want to promote new talent, you want to promote the breed in the country you're judging, or is it to award a class two, not a class one, but a class two because the quality is mediocre? What's your mindset? I, I, I think uh, you know with your FCI hat on, you, you, I, I can be a little bit forgiving. This is where I actually like the CK system of Scandinavia, because I can be a little bit forgiving um, over giving an excellent, but I definitely draw the line at giving them anything that's going to make them a champion if they're not good enough, um, because that that can do so much damage to the breed. Um, you know, if these dogs start doing a lot of winning. Um, of course, we have the grading system, which isn't used well. It's used very peculiarly in Ireland. Um, you know, they can be excellent one day and sufficient the next. Um, I'm not. I say that much in favour of grading. I, I mean, I'd actually far rather that you just judge the dogs, place them in the classes, and then you either said I'm giving it the CAC, CC, whatever, yes or no, rather than kind of because I think the grading system. Um, does really a bit like you're you're saying, you know, would you still put it up to try and encourage the breed? Um, I think it's encouraging for newcomers, maybe not with the best of dogs to be able to maybe win the class, even if they can't win a CC. Whereas with the grading system, if they're coming out and they're permanently getting goods or very goods, they soon give up. 
and they don't necessarily go and buy themselves a better one. Whereas if they can have a bit of fun and win a class or two without actually making them up a champion, I, I think it does help um, encourage newcomers. Be terribly discouraging if you were coming out getting a lower grade every show. Um, right. I think you'd pack your bags and soon get tired of them. True, agreed. No, no, fair point. Um... Well, my, actually, my next question and is is slightly different. Like, for example, you know, you judged across the world. Uh, I know, you, I know, you have judged in Australia, uh, yeah. and and of course, you know, you've judged in other parts of the world as well. My question is the placement of the boxer. Now, the boxer is supposed to be the jack of all trades. You know, you know, you know, you you know, you 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 know, you can do scent work well. Can it do it an excep exceptional job? Maybe not, but it, can it do the job? Yes, it can. Uh, it, it definitely not, cannot compete with a bloodhound in scent work, but you can do the job. Uh, if you're looking at maybe, let's say, uh, guard work, can it do guard work? Yes, it can do guard work, but is it as good as a, maybe a Malinois or a, uh, or a German Shepherd? Maybe not. So my question is this, now the placement of a boxer, in Australia, I'm just taking that example, is in the utility group uh, or the non-sporting group. But in, let's say, in other countries, it's in the working group. Where do you see the true placement of a boxer? Do you see that placement of a boxer in a working group or maybe in a non-sporting or a utility group? No, I would see it actually in a working group. Um, and, you know, sometimes people say boxers are stupid, but I think the opposite is the case. They're too intelligent. Um, uh, you know, breeds like Border Collies, German Shepherds, they, they just want to please their owner. The owner tell, tells them to go and sit in the puddle, they'll do it. Whereas the boxer will look at the puddle and look at you and say, you've got to be kidding me if you think I'm going to sit, sit in that wet puddle. I certainly am not. But they certainly have the capabilities. And, and actually, we did a dog called um, Toastmaster. At one stage, we, we kept the security dogs. Um, so there was a trainer um, up at the place, and we actually trained him for um, guard dog work. And we used a particular lead for training him. Um, and he trained superbly. And my brother was, was visiting one, one day and he was laughing. He said, that dog's useless. He'd never attack anybody. So I said, well, come out in the yard. And I put the training lead on the dog and tell you he was, <laughs> he was soon taken back his words. So I no, I definitely see them. I also think boxers, have a unique temperament um, to, uh, and I would say to any other breed, because you, you get very good natured dogs, good family dogs, good with kids, but they tend to be then a bit fools of dogs, they, they wouldn't guard. But I think the boxers have a wonderful sense of if somebody's a threat, if their owner accepts somebody, that's great. If, if the owner is a bit hesitant about it, they just seem to kind of know and um, when they should maybe growl or bark at somebody, when they should play with the youngster. And you could do anything with the boxer. They are so tolerant. Um, kids bite their ears. And, uh, you, you know, I, I, I actually think their temperament is just absolutely amazing. And no, definitely I would put them in the working group. And as you saw from um, uh, the um, pictures that Alan Dawson had commissioned. I mean, it actually does show the boxer in everything. It's it's swimming, it's jumping, it's guarding, it's playing. It's um, you know, and I I actually think that's a very intrinsic part of the boxer, and I hope we never ever lead, lose that because it it really is so important. And, and I mean, we find over the years so many families came back, they bought a boxer office. And then the kids grew up and they had their own kids and they'd come and get a boxer office. Um, and um, no, definitely, I'd, I'd definitely be for putting them in the working group. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, now, this is actually a question. Now, you mentioned, um, you know, you mentioned your mother's words. You, your mother said, if a boxer did not have a head, it, I better not call it a boxer. Uh, mm -hmm. Now. I'm actually I'm, I'm going to actually ask you a question based on what what you know from that. Um, now a boxer is you know I've heard this say you know a boxer is a is a boxer a head breed. It certainly is the most distinguishing attribute of a boxer. Uh, so some people say yes, it is a head breed. Some of the people say yes, it is actually a distinguishing character. But you have to judge it as a whole. 
and not in parts. But my question is this, is there a danger that judges might get pigeonholed judging on key attributes instead of breed type with a boxer? And I, I would agree with you over that. And, and I actually always, if I'm, if I'm talking to all a prospective all breeds judges or you know people that aren't specialists i actually always say to them please don't try to judge like a breed specialist because you you won't do it well you'll not understand the heads well enough uh, i definitely uh, would agree uh, i think in a way what well i wouldn't be just quite as definite about it as my mother was um i don't think i would ever put up anything with a poor head but then you could get four or five in a class with nice heads. So then you're looking for the overall balance. You want a bit of nobility, you want a bit of style. So it's, it, it, the, the head is, is, I suppose if it has a bad head, that's it. I, that's an eliminating factor, so to speak. Um, but it isn't maybe th that you're necessarily going to put up Oh well, look, number three there has has the best head. Okay, it's a bit, a bit straight in front and it pins or whatever it does. Um, so I'm going to put it up because it's the best head. You, you definitely have to look at the overall picture, uh, and I actually think uh, sometimes in in the past I've seen German judges come over and they're they're very nitpicking sometimes when they judge, and they you know they don't like the eyes so out it goes and they don't like something else so out it goes and they actually end up with very mediocre dogs so yeah I, I think it is dangerous uh, to, to be honest just to judge on a, a bit of a dog um, everything has to be in balance for sure and I mean there, there are heads that are very nice but not, maybe not classic heads but I mean you'd be kind of happy enough to put them up if the rest of the dog is exceptional um, but yes, I, I agree. It's a, it's a bad thing to judge in just one part of a dog, for sure. Right. Thank you. Um, now, since you mentioned about the all breed judges, and you know, I know boxer is is basically is a breed, um, you know, which is judged differently by specialist judges versus all breed judges. How fair? And I, I'm just making a statement in that you know it's judged differently by specialist judges and all breed judges um now is you know in terms of in terms of you know dog shows meaning an evaluation of breeding stock do you feel it is fair and again this could apply to other breeds as well but am i more, i'm more specific to boxes um with the evaluation of breeding stock being the aim of a, a dog show do you feel it's fair for an all breeds judge to give a nod on the on the, or the ticket to the dog uh, which is going to be the his pick of how the breed is going to has to look like on a breed that he's never kept. I think it's actually essential to have outside judges from time to time, because otherwise, as we just previously stated, the breeders will get fixated on one thing. Uh, I mean, I, I can give you an example of that. Collies, for instance, a lot of collie people, the head is absolutely the thing. So what what has happened with collies? Um, they're, they're a herding dog, but nine out of 10 of them are dreadful on the move. So I think there's always a danger if if, um, if you don't have anybody but breed specialists all the time that they, they will concentrate on, on a particular feature. So I am a great advocate of having uh, both types of judges because one, you know, an outside judge and all rounder, um, and quite often they get a bad name, but they can sometimes observe something that the breeders haven't quite noticed has crept into a breed and, and kind of draw the attention to it. Whereas if the breeders are looking at the same dogs week in, week out, they, they might actually see that gradual downhill slope that the, that the breed is going on. So I'm, I definitely am greatly in favour of, of both of them types of judges. I, I equally well, I think it would be a bad thing to always have non-breed specialists because I think you would be in danger of losing the, the breed type. 
Um, but if you get the balance, it keeps the construction in, in, in the rate and the overall balance. True. Thank you so much. Um, and I actually wanted to take, wanted to take you know go back in time you know meaning uh, go back to the books of history. Uh, Frost Stockman. Uh, Frost Stockman when she visited, uh, I believe this was the Boxer Club of Cincinnati in the United States. Uh, she picked a dog, uh, which was a four month old puppy. Uh, she called the dog the Little Lustig. Uh, that was actually the famous Bangaway of Sarah Crest. Uh, now. We actually, you know, what is, and again, he was not the dog. And he, I think he said he's the best boxer in the United States then. He was a four month old puppy then. Oh, yeah. uh, but, you know, I always hear judges say they should judge the dog based on the way they are presented then and not how they could potentially look in the future. Because, you know, it's the day off the show that how they look is what decides how they're going to decide on the outcome of a dog. What? Is what does it take for a judge to actually, um, you know, make a statement like that? Or I've not seen judges make statements, or I've not heard judges make statements like that, saying, "Hey, this is going to be the next great dog." Um, what makes a judge make a statement like this? Well, first of all, I do definitely think you have to judge them on the day, um, and with, with with big, I look with the toy pool, a seven months old toy pool can look finished and you know it probably is but a seven or eight month old boxer is not finished so you can look at it and say i think that is going to be the greatest and you can write it in your critique that i think this is going to be the greatest but if you put it in a champions class or in an open class is it going to look mature enough to win against them and i think if the answer given that there's reasonable opposition the qualities there um I I think you know to kind of predict when you actually by putting them up then um, that that's not the best of things that you should be judging them on the day because who knows do do you know is that puppy going to body up do you know is it going to grow on uh, do you know is the head going to develop um, but equal, equally well um, there's nothing to stop you saying I think this this is going to be the greatest I'm not putting it up today. Um, because these dogs are good quality and they are, um, you know, so much more more mature. Uh, but you know, give this dog six months, and I think it'll be uh, beating the the rest of you. Sometimes too, it can be the kiss of death in England if a if a puppy wins um, a, a a lot at an early age. You know. If, then people are looking at it and say, oh, is that, that, is that that eight months old puppy that went out and won best of breed last week? And, and sometimes I think it actually makes it quite hard for them that people are looking at them very critically. And of course, they're, well, I don't know whether Mr. Brace is listening, but he was the specialist in putting up puppies and he was usually right. Um, he, he was great at, 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 at um, finding new stars. Um, I think there's nothing nicer than them see young stuff. and. What what um, I find quite depressing when you're judging abroad and you get the breeders groups and, and, and things in the Scandinavian country, and you get a breeders group in and you see the father or the mother and you look down at the kids and you think, my heavens, what what did they do? They started off with these nice dogs and look in heaven's name what they're producing now, and then vice versa if they start off with with them. Um, well, first of all, I don't know why if you have a mediocre dog, mediocre dog you choose to pick from it at all when there's lots of better dogs out there. But if you start off with a mediocre bitch and then you look down the line and you say, well, look, you look, that son's pretty decent or that granddaughter's pretty. And you think, gosh, these leaders are really getting somewhere and, and the young stop is, is improving. So it's actually lovely to see a breed that the, the young ones, the puppies and the juniors, are actually better than the older ones or have the prospect of being so. Um, so I think you can express your appreciation of them, but I'm, I'm not the biggest believer in putting them up if they're not the finished article. Given that there's competition, obviously, you know, you, you'd put them up if, if the, the opposition isn't up to standard. True. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now, I, I know that great dogs are not made 
uh, and again, this is a statement again. Uh, great dogs are not made only in the developing box. Great dogs are made by technology as well. Um, we have a lot of technology around us, you know, which was not there 20, 30 years back. You know, we have uh, social media. Uh, we have, you know, which is not, you know, which is actually kind of cannibalized the print uh, print magazines. But there's more information out there, and it's a, it's the world whole world is connected. So. From a judge, from when you look at it from a, as a judge, um, do you think technology has become a boon or bane for judges? Because you know what you're going to be judging. Well, I, I, to be honest, I don't bother, and my memory wouldn't be good enough anyway if I saw photographs of top wind and dogs or whatever, so they've forgotten. But, but I, sometimes I forget what the handlers looked like by the time I finish judging, so I certainly wouldn't bother me in the very slightest. Technology is great nowadays. Um, particularly in, in, in an all-rounders world where you get landed with judging breeds that you're really not that familiar with because you can go online and find extended breed standards, you can find industry breed standards, you can you find an awful lot of information on different breeds and that's extremely helpful. Um, yes, of course, Facebook and all, all these social medias are, are a great advertising tool. And I read very recently on Facebook um, about the English show, seeing how interesting it was to see all the new posts up that shows were starting again. So people were advertising their wins. I don't know if it really influences judges. I think you'd need to be pretty feeble minded to be influenced by a photo on, on social media. I, I really do. Um, but I, I suppose it does happen for sure. I suppose it does. But I, I think most judges are a bit stronger minded than that. Um, but sure, it really, social media is just the same as the old form of advertising, which, of course, America has down to a fine art. Look at all their glossy magazines that the, the judges flick through before they judge. So it's the same difference, really, isn't it? You know, I think if you want to be influenced, you've got to be influenced, whether it's by social media, advertising, or just pressure generally so um I, I don't pay much attention to it at all it doesn't bother me thank you thank you man um i want to actually ask you this question i i know that you know you know the fact that you've been with uh, dogs or with a breed um uh, for so long talks a lot about your resilience and um you know with a breed you know of course it might not have been a bed of roses all along uh it would have had testing times you know where you know you had to look deep and you know deep within to to actually you know, continue with the breed so my question is is going to be very specific about you know the three hats that uh you wear or you continue to wear one of a breeder an exhibitor and a judge what have been your biggest frustrations well, I mean, I think things like um, obviously losing puppies is, is very hard. Um, I think that's one of the worst, actually. You know, if you get puppies either born dead or, or you get a decent litter and then one by one they, they die and you end up with only rare and two or something like that. I think that that's terribly frustrating. Um, Obviously, current boxers is also a problem, but I know it's quite controversial. That, you know, at the moment, if you if you end up with half a litter of whites, um, that's kind of very discouraging too. Um, I think as a breeder, every kennel that's successful goes through peaks and troughs. You, you know, you get on a great run, and sometimes you have two or three good dogs at the same time. And then you go into a, a, a bit of a, a, a fallow spell where you just don't seem to be able to do anything right. And I have to say, in, in boxers, I would have to say that I think um, when you, this is just my own experience, that when, when you go for outcrosses, that quite often that doesn't pay you off to the second generation when, when hopefully you'll get back into your type again. So I, I, I think as a, as a breeder, you just need to stick with it and also know the, the, the direction you want to go to and what dogs to use to get you in that, that direction. As a, as a judge, um, I, I think what, what one of the most frustrating things that actually happened to me at, at, at Crufts um, 
last year. I was doing the AV um, import classes and, and the upgrades come in and the most beautiful, beautiful, beautiful white um, Swiss Shepherd bitch came in and uh, an easy winner. And when I went over, went to go over, she backed off me. So I thought move her again and back up again. Tried again, she backed off me. And then I right, go on, look at the others, went back, walked around the ring, said, oh God, she's the easiest winner here. Went and had another go, and in the end, I had to stand in the middle of the ring and give myself a good talking to, say, you can't put it up. And there's no mucking about, you can't put it up, and that's it, so just don't put it up. <laughs> and it actually turned out, I, I spoke to the woman afterwards, it was um, one from Denmark, and I, you see, it shows you how good my memory was. I'd actually given her a best in show in Denmark, but, she, but I, I didn't actually write it. Recognize. But I think there's nothing worse than having the best one in the class, particularly if it's an outstandingly good one and um, it doesn't show or else it's badly presented. And I don't mean by handling. I mean, if it's a coated breed, if it's in bad condition or, you know, if they've coats. So I actually do find that terribly frustrating as a judge. Um, and sometimes you, you kind of stretch a point for something, you know, it has it has a flash of a minute when it's showing properly and you rush over to put it up and then it comes in for the challenge and it won't hardly walk on the lead. So it makes a complete fool out of you. Um, so that, that sort of thing. Um, I think as a breeder, though, the thing you have to be um, most careful about is be realistic about your own stock. Don't say the three rows. Yeah, you can try and fool the judges, but don't try and fool yourself. Um, because you're right. going to get more if that's the case, you know. Right, right, true. Um, and, and I know you talked about successes, you know, in terms of, um, you know, you, you would have seen a lot of success over the years, you know, you know, success in your breeding, uh, success in, you know, in who you competed with or against. Um, and you would actually, what I wanted to kind of understand for the benefit of those up and coming uh, fanciers who are with a breeder who just started with a breed, um, what according to you are the, are some of the traits that make for a successful breeder, exhibitor and a judge? Well, I, th I think as a breeder, what I've just said, be realistic. Um, you know, don't see your dogs through rose colored glasses. Um, and if it's constantly getting beaten, don't say it's dishonest, it's crooked to judge. Just have a look at the other dogs and see, you know, is there a reason it's getting beaten? Um, also study the breed. Look at the dogs that are producing, what type they're producing, what you need to improve. Um, and, and you, you know, kind of study the pedigree, study the dogs. Um, don't just use the dog that happens to be the top winning dog at, at the time. Uh, he may not necessarily be the best stud dog, maybe his dad is, which can quite often be the case. So I think those are very um, important factors. And also hard work too, because, you know, top dogs don't don't rear themselves. They You need to handle them, you need to get them out, you need to socialise them, you need to train them. You don't let them sit in the settee and jump out and wreck their fronts or run up and down the stairs. Um, to, to a degree, the, the way you bring them up can make a huge difference too, to, to, to show dogs. It really can. From a um, judging point of view, I think, again, it's terribly important to talk to the breeders. You know, what you were mentioning before, is it fair if all rounders judge a breed? But I think you'd find an awful lot of the experienced judges, they talk to breeders, they find out what the breeders care about. And of course, one of the great things about traveling the world is you're quite often sat at a dinner table or, or at a group ring with somebody who is a breed specialist. Um, and you learn so much from those people. So I, I think as a, as a judge, never stop asking questions and also accept that you're not going to get it right all the time, that you will make mistakes. Try not to make the same ones again. And right. try to learn from them. That and the other thing I find very very useful actually. I used to find uh, bulldogs very difficult to judge. And of course, my good friend Sheila Cartwright bred some very good bulldogs. And I had a year when I was judging them regularly. So every time I judged them, I'd come home, ring her up, and say, "Sheila, I had this or I had that." 
what what should I have done with that? How much do you care about that? And I, I think that's a great way to learn too. Um, you know, when you see something you're not quite sure about, ask and ask again. Um, I think that's also very important as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. And I've just got the last three questions for you. And um, this is actually about, uh, my, my next question is this. Now, has there been a time for you, Anne, um, when the breed or the group judge uh, sent a dog over to you for the group or the best in short judging, having overlooked a serious fault? Um, I, I, in boxers, no, not. I wouldn't quite say a serious fault. I, I, I and actually, well, never mind about the group. I have been in a situation at one of the breed club shows, and I won't, won't name either the judge or, or the or the show. Um, uh, it was it was a foreign gentleman, and I was appalled at the dog he put up. He had a head on him like a Great Dane, beautiful made dog. But for a European judge to put this dog up, I couldn't believe it. But anyway, when, when it came to best and show, which you judges together at the club shows, um, he floored me by saying, I absolutely love your bitch, but of course she's best in show and all. And I'm kind of looking at him and say, saying to myself, well, if you love my bitch, how in the heaven's name did you put that dog up, you know? So I've had that that situation. Um, obviously, there's dogs you like better than others, but I don't think I've ever actually had somebody send an absolutely awful boxer into, into the group or kind of said, oh, God, I'm sorry that it's such and such a one didn't win either. So no, I, I, thankfully I haven't actually had that situation too often, fortunately. Thank you. Um, how how do you view the how do you view the incisors? You know, like boxers have this hyperplasia, you know, where the gum overgrowth, where incisors actually are, you know, they don't show like teeth, but they show like nubs, uh, you know, between the canines. Uh, how do you view them? How do you view them in terms of how serious this? Uh, is this a serious uh, thing, DQ or you know, not a DQ? Would you actually put down a dog because it actually didn't have visible teeth? Well, um, interestingly enough, I remember my mo mother judging a, a show. I think it was in in the Midlands somewhere in England, and there was like about fourteen dogs in the open dog class, and I think about twelve of them were champions, and some of them very big winners. And she said to me after, she said, I couldn't believe it when I opened their mouths. They hardly have any teeth between their, their canines. Um, I, I personally, I don't like it, but would I put a dog down for it? Probably not if, if the width of the jaw is there and the lip placement is there. It is an unfortunate trait that's in the breed. And, and not too long ago, actually, a um, Scandinavian friend of mine was judging them and he couldn't believe the mouths at all. And I said, oh, yeah, I forgot to warn you about that. But it, it's something breeders need to, to think about. But no, probably as a judge, I'd, I'd just kind of put up with it. Um, if they, I'd, I'd probably be fussier about the width of the jaw and the lip placement than I would about actually the size of the teeth. It's one of the things actually I think the European dogs are much better at. They, they generally have much better, big, bigger teeth and, and right. they definitely still have teeth. Yeah. Right, right, perfect. Thank you, Anne. Uh, my penultimate question to you. Um, now, do, and again, this is something which, uh, you know, you know, it's, it's actually, you know, you know, we watch, you know, fanciers always look at this thing. What is going through the mindset of the judge who's judging the, the group or the best in show? Uh, in judging the group or the best in show, do judges award honest to the breed that they are familiar with or are they comfortable with? Do they have breed favorites when they get into judging the best in show? I, I, I or think a group? Yeah, I think sometimes it's a disadvantage for your own breed because you know so many things about the breed. So I'm not sure it does them a favor actually when it's your own breed. Having said, which as a, as a judge, I'm absolutely delighted if it's one of my own breeds, uh, uh, and you know I love it to bits, and I, uh, you know I want to give it the, the group or best and show. Um, I think there's definitely breeds you you are. It, it's it's not a conscious thing that you can say, well, well, look, I really like this breed and I really like that breed. But I think um, unconsciously there probably are breeds that, that 
you, you tend to do better than than others for no particular reason. Um, I, I suppose it's the same story worldwide that some breeds do, do significantly better generally in groups. They're more eye catching, they're more stylish. Um, it's not right, but um, it does tend to be. I mean, if you said to me, have you any favorite breeds? I'd probably hotly deny it, but I'm sure if you look back in my records of judging groups, you'd probably find there is a pattern of some breeds or another, you know? I'm not quite sure. I've never sat down to an analyze it. I, I don't think people, well, I, I do remember actually judging in Scandinavia once and, and a very well-known Spanish judge put up, oh God, what breed was it? It was some obscure mountain dog that, that one group too. And it, when he came back, I, I I didn't say anything, but I must have kind of looked at him, you know, with like one of those strange looks, saying, what in God's name are you doing? And he turned around and he said, well, nobody else puts them up, so I have to. <laughs> that's all I <laughs> Okay, that's, that's that's one reason for doing it, you know, uh, definitely. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um... And I actually wanted to ask you this question. Um, this might not be my last question. I might just have one more after this. Um, what are some of the things that make your heart glow, um, that you continue your interest with the breed? Oh, I don't know. You see, it broke my heart having to give them up, uh, and that was forced upon me because I, I, um, I kept rupturing my Achilles tendon uh, three years in a row. Um, and. Um, but when I kind of finally, at one stage, I thought I'd never walk without a walking stick or a crutch or something. I mean, it went on for years, not just a year. Every time I got back to showing them again, I wrecked it again. Um, I just think they're a very, very special breed. I mean, I'm lucky, that, you know, I have the poodles and I love the poodles. But um, I still, I don't know, in my old age, I can't tell my partner this, but I still quite like to have a boxer again, actually. Um, but I, I don't know whether that would ever be allowed. But they're just such a fantastic breed. And I, I, I love watching them. I, I love their characters. You know, they'll go out and they'll find a bit of an old stick or an old bottle and they'll play for it with the dental sleeve for hours. Having said which, they also used to play with their dishes, which used to drive me to Lally. You had to tie everything down. They're just, they're such a comedian. Um, they're lovely dog to look at. They're clean. They they have such great family traits, um, and I just I just love watching them anyway. And and I love looking at them. I love watching them being judged. Um, maybe not so much in some of the European countries where they're kind of a slobbering mess. Um, but having said, it, you know, it's a generalisation. I, I remember judging them in, in Gibraltar a few years ago, and I think it was four champion dog or something like that. And the four dogs all faced into each other in the middle of the ring. And there wasn't a cross word said, but they eyeballed each other. And that was just such a magnificent sight. I'd love to go and got the camera taking a photograph of them. They, they kind of, they were all standing their ground, but the, the, there, were, there were no growling, there was no fighting. Um, having said which, I wasn't about to walk between them, you know, in case they fly <laughs> my way here. Um, but they, they're just such a mixture of temperaments and 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 um, attitudes and, and and they can play the fool and yet they can play the, the, the guard dog and I mean nothing um, pleases me more is to look into a box ring and see something that makes the hair stand on your back and your neck and you go wow just look at that isn't that special um, right I just love that I really do wonderful it'll uh, always have uh, a big place in my heart that's for sure okay uh my, my, my final question to you is this. Um, you've seen the boxes in the last, and this is actually, I, I would term this as a time travel question. And 15 years, you look at the evolution of boxes 50 years, or maybe even greater than 50 years, right from the, right from the World War II, from, right from the time, at 1939, when your mother brought the boxes into Ireland. You looked at boxes from that till now. I want you to look at, you know, I would I would want you to think about you know hypothetical question. So if I if you went magically transported back you know forward in time fifty years down 
50 years, you know, maybe 50 years upwards, you know, 20, 70 in, you know, in, in maybe Dr. Brown or, you know, you can choose Dr. Who's, uh, you know, uh, phone booth. You can you can make a choice. Either you can go America, American way or the British way. Uh, how would you like the boxer to look 50 years down the line? In some ways, I wouldn't mind if they went back to what Lustig looked like. I thought he looked, looked fantastic and so well made. Um, I, I think I, I probably over the years, and I know I'll get shot by the, for this by some of my friends, I've actually got probably a bit more Americanized in my view of boxers because I, lo I love the style of them and I, I, I love their nobility. There's certain things, of course, you don't like, um, like the bone in the feet, but equally well, they're not all, they're not all like that. Um, I think the boxer through through the years generally has gone through different stages but, but you know we've seen in in the uk um you, you get a, a dominant stud dog and and uh, you know as i was saying earlier you know picasso brought the elegance the style um and you know great showmanship in and then then we've had you know stud dogs that have brought other wet heads in but i think the whole thing is if the breeders realize the direction they're going and then say right well we need to start cleaning up these heads or we need to get more chin or we need to get more leg um you know i, I would um, like to think they would um, be able to deal with it but um I, I do think America actually has some very nice dogs, and I know I'll get shot for saying this, but I do actually think that they've, they've got some lovely dogs. Having said which, you know, you know, we tend to, and I'm guilty of it too, I tend to condemn the European dogs of getting too short and muscle, and, and uh, a fault I absolutely hate to is when they have so much upturn of the, the lower jaw that they're catching the lower the, the, on the fangs, the top lip on the fangs, which I absolutely hate. Um, but there are still some very, very, very good European dogs. They're not all like that, but they're not as plentiful as they would have been. I mean, years ago, the Spanish and the Italians had the most wonderful, wonderful boxers. Um, but certainly, I, I, you know, I would like to think that they, they will stick fairly true to their beats and not get too exaggerated. I mean, the big fault at the moment is, is the straight upper arms and, and the overangulated back ends. So I hope that... that um, you know, people will have a look at that and say, look, we need to get back to having a bit of forechest and, um, you know, the hindquarters shouldn't be a mile behind them. They, they should be basically under them. But I think probably as things evolve, they, they, they will stay fairly elegant dogs and, and probably stabilise fairly much in, in type. I mean, I suppose it, Britain is lucky in one sense and it's, it's kind of got a foot in each camp. It's sort of got the American influence and it's got the European influence. So they're fairly middle of the road. And I don't think that north-south divide that I talked about earlier um, exists nearly so much as it did then. I mean, it certainly was a very strong divide at that point. Um, and um, even judging, like uh, I'm not saying it was dishonest judging, it, it was just the type they like, but uh, you know, Pat Withers, if she, she was Jed Mary Ham, they, they tended to put up each other's dogs, but I'm, I'm not calling it dishonest, I'm saying it was the type they liked, and then in the south the wardrobes would put up their own breeding and um, that, st that style of dog. Um, but I no, that, I mean, those days, I wouldn't mind actually if you saw some of those wardrobe type dogs back in the ring again in a few years' time. I think they'd be kind of nice to see you too. But I think um, the boxers will probably stay. I hope construction will improve a bit in the future. And I, I think one of the big problems with breed judging in, in England is they don't move them around the ring enough. You know, it tends to be once up and down, maybe the whole class round once, and that's it. Um, I think they could do with looking at the profile movement an awful lot more. But, you know, what the breed will look like. Well, if you look back in the um, 30s and the 40s, what the breed looked, my heavens, we've come a long way. And I have to say, I think we've done it well. So I would like to think that they'll still be looking pretty good in, in, in 40 or 50 years' time. I think my biggest fear would be that will they have become boxer doodles or God knows what? <laughs> um, 
<laughs> you know. Right, Thankfully, right. No, nobody's thought of making a Doctor Who poodle yet that I know of. Right, you know? Um, right, right. No, thank God. You know that that's what that's not happened. I hope it doesn't happen. And by uh, you know by you having bred both boxes and poodles, and you know you you actually to say that that's not a good combination. Please don't do that. Well, Please don't. don't. Do that. <laughs> <laughs> probably get a question for them. <laughs> right, oh, right. Very true. Um, thank you so much, Anne. That concludes all my questions for the day. Um, and I, I first of all want to thank you again. You know, this was uh, an education in itself. Um, you know, it you know it felt like uh, it felt like or this interview, which is which we went live, is going to be available for um, for viewers to watch you know, offline on YouTube app or, you know, not on Facebook, but on YouTube, it's going to be available under Indian Boxer Ring. And so with just like the, all the other interviews, but I'm sure this interview is going to be viewed much um, because there's a wealth of information, a wealth of perspectives that you presented, a wealth of knowledge. Uh, it was a pleasure interviewing you uh, and, uh, you know, listening to your such rich perspectives about the breed thank you so much for being a wonderful ambassador for the breed and and before we before we end do you have any parting words that you'd like to share well i just think for, for those still breeding and showing take good care of the breed it's a very very special breed it really is and again i would apologize i got a bit carried away with what i was saying in the presentation i really didn't mean to go over an hour in it. i should have put a stopwatch beside me <laughs> No, no, not at all. Please. Sorry about that. But thank you indeed for, for having me. You've had wonderful people on, and, and I, I look forward to, to seeing your next guest anyway. Wonderful. Thank you so much, and thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. And stay safe and uh, meet you in the next interview. Thank you so much. Okay. Good night or good afternoon. Yeah.